Good evening, and welcome to the sixth installment in a series of six virtual town halls being presented by the New River Valley Public Health Task Force. We appreciate you welcoming us into your homes or wherever you may be viewing this event. We're joined again this week by Doug Williams, who is providing sign language interpretation services. Thank you, Doug, for your assistance with our series. You will learn as we move through our program the New River Valley is blessed with leaders who care deeply about our communities and they truly work well together. As a result, our citizens should feel confident as we collectively navigate COVID-19 in the New River Valley. My name is Kevin Bird and I'm the Executive Director of the New River Valley Regional Commission and I've had the pleasure of serving as moderator for the virtual town hall series. The New River Valley Public Health Task Force I referenced earlier has been hard at work since early March, aligning resources and deploying strategies to support the public health needs of our region. Nearly four months ago, local law enforcement, fire and rescue organizations, hospital and public health officials, local government managers, local public information officers, education officials, and others began to develop and activate regional plans for the COVID-19 pandemic. Since then, the New River Valley Public Health Task Force has been working through phase one mitigation, providing increasing levels of testing to all communities in the region and securing testing resources and protective equipment for frontline medical and public safety personnel. Each week since March, the task force has provided scalable drive-through test sites across the NRV with faster turnaround time for test results. The task force also prioritized clear and consistent messaging and an abundance of public information, a result of which is this six week series of virtual interactive town halls with our sixth one tonight. Our series continues this week with the topic of education, focusing on colleges and universities in the region. The panel assembled this evening is composed of the presidents of both universities and the community college, and they're directly involved with the New River Valley's response to COVID-19. The questions the panel will be addressing were submitted by residents across the region prior to tonight's town hall. For more information about this series, you can visit www.montva.com forward slash NRV town hall. You may also submit live questions via Twitter by using the hashtag NRV Stronger Together. We'll answer them as we're able with time permitting. As I introduce each panelist, they'll provide a brief introductory statement. First up this evening, we have Brian Hemphill. He is president of Bradford University. Thank you, Kevin. I'm Brian Hemphill, president of Bradford University. I've had the privilege of serving as president since July 1st of 2016. Um, so I'm starting my fifth year. Uh, before that, I was at West Virginia State University as president and also had a stint at Northern Illinois University and the University of Arkansas. Great, thank you, President Hemphill. Next, we have Pat Huber. She is president of New River Community College. Good evening, thank you. Uh, I'm finishing my third year here as president of New River Community College, although I've been here full-time 28 years. Uh, I've been a resident of the New River Valley now for I think about 35 years. So uh, uh, pleased to be here this evening, thank you. Thank you, President Huber. Next, we have Timothy Sands. He is president of Virginia Tech. Thank you, Kevin. It's great to be here with my colleagues, Pat and, and uh, Brian. Uh, I've been at Virginia Tech since 2014. Prior to that, I was a provost and acting president at Purdue University. I was a nanotechnology technologist for most of my career before I became a higher ed administrator about a decade ago. Uh, my wife and I have lived all over the country, California a couple of times, uh, New Jersey, um, the Midwest, even a little bit in Europe, and nothing beats the uh, NRV in terms of quality of life. So we're really happy to be here. Great. Well, thanks to each of you for joining us this evening and providing insight on the response to COVID-19 in the New River Valley. Our first series of questions this evening revolve around an item everyone has been monitoring closely in the news, and that's the higher education plans for operations in the fall. Can each of you start us off with an overview of your institution's plans to operate in the fall? I guess I'll start. Um, we made an announcement actually a few weeks ago, and, and it was an announcement regarding early opening. 
And so our plan is to open on August 12th. And then opening on August 12th with classes, we will allow us to really be able to conclude the semester the week before our traditional Thanksgiving break. And that will conclude with our exams as well as commencement. Um, but I will tell you that we've been thinking about a number of things in preparing for this from focusing on contact tracing to testing, PPE to social distancing. So it's so a number of things that we're focused on as, as we're thinking about our preparation. Of course, as the time draws pretty near for, for Radford University. Sure. Okay, I'll follow up. Um, we actually released a statement today, just this morning. Uh, our classes will begin August 24th, uh, predominantly online both in a synchronous format. For instance, some of our instructors will be using Zoom for synchronous um, classes and in an asynchronous format. Uh, we will run our first two weeks of classes totally remotely. And then on September 8th, we will uh, start bringing students on campus. These are our students in performance-based classes we're heavy uh, CTE programs, things like welding, machining, instrumentation, those types of programs. Students will uh, come on for their labs, their clinical portions of those programs. Of course, we're gonna be following uh, appropriate guidelines for social distancing and um, face coverings. And then uh, we're going to update the schedules uh, this summer so students can see um, and, and have the information. We're gonna run continuously through um, until the Thanksgiving break, not going to take a fall break. And then the last two weeks of our classes and our exams will be done remotely. Students will not come back on campus after Thanksgiving. At Virginia Tech, we're following a similar set of principles uh, as uh, New River Community College in Radford. Um, slight variation though, uh, we decided to stick to our original schedule, which would be starting instruction on the 24th of August, but we'll pivot away from uh, in-person instruction and uh, most of our students will leave the residence halls uh, at Thanksgiving break and go online for the last eight instructional days and then online for finals. Uh, again, I'm sure we're all using the same principles and uh, making sure that we have the priority uh, first of safety and health and well-being of our community and that we want to maintain our mission uh, so we want the teaching and research and outreach to continue uh, and we might want to make sure that the the communities we serve are economically vital in the fall uh, i think really when you and we're completely data driven we want to be transparent authentic and, and timely in our communications but uh, one of the things that uh, we really thought hard about and i'm sure my colleagues uh, did the same is what is it that's really special about a Virginia Tech education? And, and when we thought about it, we're really, we really are a residential, especially at the undergraduate level, residential institution. And it's the, it's the student experience that is in person that is the distinguishing feature, to be honest. And so we're gonna try to do as much of that as possible. But when you look at the constraints that, uh, that public health considerations impose, especially in, in today's uh, understanding of those constraints, uh, it means that about a third of the typical students' experience will be in person. The rest of it will be some form of online, remote, synchronous, asynchronous. And we're still working through that. We promise to have by mid-July a very detailed accounting of how each course, each section is going to operate. Very good. I imagine there's a whole host of decisions that have to get made as you're trying to navigate operations. Can you all share some insight on that decision-making process as you were approaching your return to operations in the fall? Who has been involved in those conversations with you? Well, maybe I'll start this one and we'll go in reverse order. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we um, started to realize we had a problem in late January, mainly with respect to study abroad. And we had a um, incident management team set up or emergency response uh, process uh, was activated. We had an um, incident, res incident response team that uh, our leadership team is on and started dealing with the study abroad folks. But then it quickly escalated. And now we have 
uh, almost too many working groups and task forces to count. Uh, and they're organized up through the president's cabinet. Uh, and uh, it's just ongoing every day, all day. There's some group working on some issue uh, and refining plans and then feeding them up to make sure that, that everybody's on board, that everybody understands what we're doing. Uh, we're also working with um, uh, the Virginia Department of Health. The New River Health District has been incredibly helpful to us. The state, uh, the governor has uh, a task force working on higher ed. The Council of Presidents, which uh, we serve on together, it, it meets on a weekly basis and we talk about uh, what we're doing together. We have a public health working group associated with that. So um, it's, it's been um, an incredibly intense experience and, and will continue to be going forward. It's all about communication. It's all about uh, getting as many voices in the room. We have been involved at Virginia Tech with our, our, our faculty Senate cabinet through this entire process because we wanna make sure that we're more or less aligned uh, with the faculty on the way they're thinking about things. But once we made our announcement on Monday, uh, we've started to engage many other groups that, that haven't been in the room. So that's just going to grow and grow and grow as we approach the fall. I'll follow and say for us, it's been not only an across campus, but also an across the state collaboration. New River Community College is one of 23 colleges in in a system of community colleges for the state. And of course, our chancellor is based in Richmond. So we're looking at, although we're, we're only 3% of the entire community college population, we're looking at a, over 100,000 students in any given semester across Virginia in the community college. So the chancellor has convened twice a week. We've been meeting by way of Zoom, the uh, presidents and the leadership teams from the colleges. And then um, as President Sands said, all kinds of groups across campuses um, uh, working. We're a small campus here, so we can communicate uh, easily, even though we're apart. Um, uh, and uh, lots of entities involved and then pulling all of that information together and the uh, larger group, our reopening work group um, met yesterday to finalize some of the points that we've been um, struggling with and will continue to, to work with. Uh, Kevin, our process, what I would say is probably very similar to what, what uh, President Sands described, in that as, as we realized very quickly, we had a, a problem, the emergency management team came together, and we started dealing immediately with the international student issues that we know we have students abroad, faculty abroad, and we launched what is our, our COVID-19 contingency planning group, which is made up of individuals across every division within the institution, um, including faculty leadership from faculty senate, and so it's, it's really been great watching those that, that group work together and some of the work that they've done. And they've provided a lot of recommendations. All of the recommendations that have come forward has come through that particular group. But as, as, as President Sands mentioned a second ago, that the work beyond the campus, that we've been able to communicate with our colleagues at the other public universities, as well as the governor's office, as well as Chev, all has been very, very helpful of funneling information and insight into the work that we're doing. So you just mentioned Chev. Um, have there been directives from Richmond or elsewhere on how each of your institutions were to approach operations in the fall? Yeah. I begin by saying that, that I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, Governor Northam and his leadership in the midst of this crisis that we're dealing with within the Commonwealth and of course across the nation and the world. Um, but his leadership, his insight, the thought of developing um, pretty early on in this process, what was a, a COVID education work group that included K-12, higher education, the health sector, and they developed some, some really great guidelines for the institutions to consider in terms of reopening and providing that information. We were already developing our own plans and to be able to connect those guidelines to our plans was really, really insightful. And Chev will be involved as a part of those final steps in that process. So I would just say that we've had a great deal of support from, from, from individuals from Richmond and across the Commonwealth. 
Now, SHEV is an acronym. Can you explain what that organization is? Well, SHEV is our, our, our if you will, they are uh, our governing body, if you will, for higher education, community colleges, as well as our four-year public institutions. Um, they have a relationship with our private institutions as well. And so it's, it really provides a great avenue for all of the, the institutions to come together, share insights, think about the future and some of the great work that's going on. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we add the layer of the VCCS, Virginia Community College System. Uh, our work is all funneled as far as all the community colleges to the system office and through then to CHEV. Um, we've received um, wonderful guidance from the VCCS and, and from other entities, as they said, the governor's office. Uh, but the, the thing about this situation is that it, it just changes so rapidly, changes every day. Yeah, I could maybe add that it's a, a very collaborative situation with um, all of our partners in the state and in the community. Because it's changing all the time it, and evolving so quickly, I think everybody treats everybody else as, um, as a source of ideas and insight uh, rather than as some kind of a uh, uh, ordered uh, structure where there's someone at the top that's going to make the decision. It's very collaborative. And uh, as uh, Pat said, it changes every day. We're fortunate on our campuses, though, to have experts who can also feed into this. I don't want to um, uh, forget to, to, to mention that we have probably 20 or 30 faculty, at least, on the Virginia Tech campuses that have been directly involved in consulting and then providing their expertise to uh, BDH and to the Secretary of Education. Tim, and I will also say to you that Tim and I have had several calls back and forth um, <laughs> and communicating about a number of issues that are, that's on his mind or my mind. So mm -hmm. it's been helpful. It's really collaborative. Well, it's interesting you bring up that, that point of uh, faculty and their expertise and contributing to national information and yeah, it's great to see that recognition of the expertise that's here in the region uh, making a big difference on the national scale. Um, earlier, uh, you all had referenced working with the New River, New River uh, Health District. And how have you all been working with local agencies in the health district through this process? Well, I guess it's my turn to, to go first this time. So, so I'll just start by, uh, I'd like to express appreciation to the New River Valley Public Health Task Force. Uh, Dr. Bissell and Chief uh, Wilson from uh, Blacksburg, I'll, I'll give a shout out to them because I think they may have gotten the ball rolling on this. Uh, uh, New River, we have representatives on that task force. What I appreciate again is that it's a regional approach. I know when this really started breaking loose um, in March, I think the very first call I made, because it's a health issue, I called Dr. Bissell and, and we've had, and she has met with us um, by Zoom, by the telephone conference um, with us to advise us because, you know, we don't have that level of expertise on our uh, campus. But beyond that, our own local college advisory board, our, uh, even our foundation board, our public schools have been a big, um, entity with us as well and our relationships with public schools, our relationships with the community, our local governments, um, especially our local governments now with our ACE program and what we are providing through this um, next year with all of the entities and what that means to students. So uh, from our perspective as a community college, I would say it has truly been a community effort uh, in our, which is our title. I would agree with that. I would just, uh, the task force has been wonderful. Um, just to give a couple of little, little insights into the way we've been communicating beyond the task force. Uh, the mayor of Blacksburg, uh, Leslie Hager Smith and Dr. Bissell and I have a three-way Zoom call periodically, and we check in just to see how things are going, if we missed anything. And that has been incredibly helpful because 
uh, some of the decisions we're making are can't be made in a vacuum. They have huge impact on our local communities, especially in Blacksburg for uh, Virginia Tech. The other um, really helpful collaboration has been with uh, the New River Health District and Dr. Bissell and testing. You know, we had two testing labs that have been set up, one in Roanoke and one in Blacksburg, that our faculty and students have, have got to, gotten together and built these testing, really analysis labs. And, and we're doing that through the New River Health District and through our Shippert um, Student Center, Health Center. And uh, that has turned out to be a great partnership. It's a, it's a daily communication. Where do we need the tests? Where do we need, who's, who needs to uh, do the analysis? And it's not about just higher ed. Um, our analysis capability is used by the New River Health District in all sorts of congregate settings around the region. So it, it, it really is a community uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, I would echo the, the sentiments of my colleagues. The only thing that I would mention um, going back to the New River Health District, um, being able to have conversations or conversation with Dr. Bissell um, about some of her thoughts and perspectives on this and things that we should be thinking about and considering the fact that she was already working and thinking about the return of student athletes on both campuses and the work that they were thinking about and timing of that return. Um, the fact that you have Jason Dees who has not missed one of our emergency management operations meetings. He's attended every single meeting and having his insight um, has been absolutely amazing. So I would just say that the relationships that we have um, are so important and valuable in this work that we're attempting to do. President Sands, you brought up testing and your collaborations there that are um, proving very positive right now. How, how are you all each approaching the COVID-19 testing with your students, faculty, and staff as they return for the fall? I guess I'll start with, with that one. Um, as, as we're looking at testing, one of the things that, that I would say that we're days away from at this point signing um, what is a, a pretty comprehensive contract that will allow us to have some large scale testing as students are returning. Um, we're working through details right now of the initial groups that will be returning during the summer. Um, for example, our student athletes, our RAs, our Quest advisors, um, so we're going to make sure that we're able to provide that testing for, for that group. And then we're going to be thinking about groups that are coming back, or what we would say prevalence testing or hotspots that are coming from some of those locations to the New River Valley. That will be a lot of our focus from a testing standpoint. And then we're looking at the algorithm that will be developed as it relates to ongoing testing that we will have as we go through the, the semester. And that may be a focus on some symptoms type of testing. But one of the other things that, that I'm pretty excited about, that is there are a couple of different groups that are working on some things around the symptoms app. And there are some things that were shared with me today that look like we're getting really, really close. And that will allow our faculty, our staff and students to be able to, in essence, self-share, self-report or share some of their symptoms. And that allows you to stay ahead of some of the challenges that may be developing. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited about the approach we're taking. And we're really taking our guidance from the health department, as well as uh, a few others in the state at the University of Virginia. Um, our, our colleagues there have worked on a model that really gives some key insight for institutions that are interested in looking at some of their thoughts about how you should be thinking about the testing model. And of course, Virginia Tech has uh, just great work that they're doing in that same space as well. Now, I could just say that um, we're doing something very similar to what uh, President Hippel described. Um, it's a comprehensive testing plan that is not just about viral testing, but uh, will incorporate, when, when ready, uh, antibody testing or serologic testing. Uh, we're not planning to test everyone. Uh, we're trying to be focused about that. I think that's really unrealistic. But as uh, President Hippel described, there are uh, opportunities to test uh, students coming in who were symptomatic, who, uh, who have been symptomatic in the past, recently. Uh, we're looking at quarantine space, setting that aside, um, and isolation space for those who have, been, uh, who have uh, symptoms. And um, we're working um, hard on the, the apps that we think and the, the testing um, tools, if you will, or the symptomatic uh, tracing tools and the contact tracing that we think will be useful. It's all evolving very quickly. 
Uh, we've got a lot of assets around the state that we're consulting as uh, President Hipple mentioned. So uh, we're, we're planning to announce our, for our detailed testing strategy on July 3rd or before. Uh, we've already published a bit of it at, uh, on, on Monday and it can be found on the bt.edu slash ready uh, website. But uh, it's more or less what, what you just heard from uh, President Hemphill. Um, it's a rapidly evolving area, so it's hard to, uh, to pin it down right now, but um, we will be working with BDH. In other words, our testing capability at Virginia Tech will uh, largely go through um, the uh, Virginia Department of Health, and they will be the broker. Uh, but we're also telling them what we think we're going to need in terms of testing capacity on a daily basis so that we can set that aside and make sure that happens. All the institutions in Virginia are also coming together to try to coordinate. So recognizing that a lot of our institutions don't have their own testing capability or may not even be able to, to work out a contract such as what you heard about Radford doing, um, we're trying to uh, make sure we have everyone covered, not just the ones that have the big health centers. And that's a process that's um, ongoing, but uh, there's a commitment to it across all of higher ed. And of course, we're a commuter campus. We don't have the dormitories. So our, our students are residents of the New River Valley. So that would be in cooperation with the New River Health Valley Health District. Great. And as we pointed out earlier, the welcome is that there is the drive through testing has been made available throughout the communities and um, that will be remaining for the foreseeable future as well. Um, aside from testing, what steps have you all taken or will be taking to protect students, employees, and the communities? Well, I can say a little, maybe start this one off. Um, Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus, and we've got sites all over the Commonwealth, but our Blacksburg campus sits in a small town called Blacksburg. And uh, we can't look at the campus as being isolated from uh, the town. They're, the people are moving back and forth all day, every day. And so we're trying to do this in a holistic manner. And that's where the VDH and the New River Health District come in in terms of kind of coordinating. Uh, but um, we are planning and we set aside um, housing for students who are isolated uh, and for, for um, quarantine as well. Uh, we're working with our faculty and staff to develop a process for that when they become symptomatic and, and or, or have been tested, or if they end up coming, uh, contracting the disease, which we hope they won't, but uh, we're working through all sorts of flexible models that will allow them to uh, stay engaged when they're able, um, maybe remotely. Uh, and these are, uh, one thing we're learning, we're learning a couple of things, but one thing that's really clear is that we have to take a very individual approach to this. There's, it's very difficult to come up with um, simple policies that, that somehow capture every um, outcome or every potential situation. So one of the, the, the efforts that we're going through right now, working right now with our, uh, our Disability Alliance and, and uh, Caucus to try to think through, okay, what are the, the possibilities? How do we set this up so that people feel comfortable reporting symptoms when that's important, we feel comfortable not coming to work or not coming to campus when that would be a bad idea? Um, and part of that's about uh, making accommodations and providing information, but a lot of it's about making sure that there's an incentive or certainly not a disincentive uh, to, to take yourself out of the, the physical um, realm when, when you have uh, symptoms or you've been exposed. So lots to work on. It's just very complicated, but um, it, it will be individual, uh, individualized, and it will really be focused around making sure that those who are most vulnerable are, are, are minima, have minimal exposure. Uh, and uh, we can't make it perfect, but we think we can do a good job if we stay on it. And the second, the last uh, point I'll mention here is that culture's everything. So we can set up all sorts of rules and procedures and policies, and it won't work unless there's a culture of um, protecting each other. Uh, even people we don't know yet, we need to be thinking about them. And so a lot of our work over the next a couple of weeks will be focused on com communications, coordinated communications with the community, but also uh, developing uh, that culture, which we think is already there, but it's got to be, it's got to be emphasized because it's not a compliance thing. It's, it's really about 
are we going to protect each other and be successful in the fall or are we going to let it go and we're not going to let it go we won't let that happen but uh but um, if it's gonna work well, it's gonna be because the entire community buys in. And I think for us, you know, even on campus, um, doing, making a lot of changes. Um, first of all, starting with our schedule and thinking about our courses and, you know, how many students are gonna be on campus at any given time, not only who's here but for how long so it's 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 also a, a duration of time uh, but modifying uh, workspaces um, uh, the the learning spaces uh, removing furniture in some places you know where students are are apt to congregate or people are apt to congregate you know the the wellness shields um, having the uh, enough supplies, uh, cleaning, disinfecting supplies, uh, even thinking about the flow of the foot traffic, you know, and, and do you put signage on the, on the floors to make sure that, you know, the hallways. So it's, it's lots of big picture items, but also it's a lot of the little details that you have to get down and, and think about. Uh, because we, we want to protect. We want to be wise about it. Kevin, the only thing that I would add to that, because I agree with everything that both of my colleagues have shared, um, it really comes down to, to social responsibility. And community, sending a message, a clear message to your students, your faculty and staff, are we going to be in a situation where we're truly caring about each other and the decisions that we're making, knowing the broad implications that it could have if we don't. And so, I, you know, we all are, mo the most part, we're putting the same type of strategies in place, but it really comes down to that social responsibility and what individual students, what choices they're going to make and, and, and what role we're gonna play in helping to guide them. And it begins with the communication and it ends with communication and then the actions that will be taken as a part of it. We had a question that came in a little while ago and it says that both Radford University and Virginia Tech have plans for students not to return to the region after Thanksgiving break to prevent the spread of COVID. What precautions will be made for students who travel back home every weekend of the fall semester to not spread COVID in the newer Valley when they return? Well, we're discouraging students from doing that actively and that's part of that community Communication strategy, but realistically, you know, people are going to move around. But we're we're telling folks that if they are going to a place where there's an outbreak, um, they really need to report it, and we're going to expect them to uh, go into quarantine and uh, and perhaps be tested. So we have to stay on top of that. But uh, again, getting back to President Hippel's point, that it's really about um, a culture of uh, supporting each other. So if someone does need to go home and they're, they're going home to a place where there's a, a, a large, a, a high prevalence of COVID-19, uh, we want them to feel comfortable when they come back to say, hey, I've been so-and-so, um, what can you help me avoid exposure to others in case I may have uh, picked up the disease? And that worked for us really well. That's why I'm optimistic. That worked for us really well when we brought um, our students back from study abroad in March. Um, it was uh, students voluntarily went into either isolation or quarantine, self-quarantine. Uh, they worked with the, with the local health department in our student health center to, uh, to determine how long they needed to stay away from others. And uh, we didn't have an outbreak. So I, I, I think it can work, but it will require a culture of supporting everyone, each other. Kevin, the only thing that I would add to that is that, that we, have, we will be taking a similar approach in terms of encouraging students not to leave, not to go home. Um, being realistic, we know that there are going to be a family emergency or there will be something that will happen. But I'm cautiously optimistic on, on, on another front. When, we, when this initially started, we developed a, a, a survey, if you will, that we sent out to our students that we knew that at that point, were traveling for spring break um, and that were away from the campus, wherever they may have been. 
I, we were we were shocked at the number of students that actually responded and shared that information, which allowed us to be able to follow up and have conversations with them about basically locations they had attended and some of the things that we might need them to do as a part of it. So I think that people will be be responsible and and but we're going to have to make sure we're continuing to communicate. It sounds like there's lots more information forthcoming on protocols uh, for the communities that uh, how will you all be monitoring compliance with those protocols? Well, I can, I can maybe <clears throat> add a little um, depth to that, to my previous answer. It's certainly about culture. We are, we do have a, uh, um, Hokey wellness commitment that we're asking all of our residents of the residence halls, if they want to sign up for a housing contract, they are being asked to sign this. It's not um, the kind of document that you know would, would really help from a legal point of view, maybe a little bit, but it's really more about making sure that everyone's making a commitment. And that is part of the contract. So if you're going to stay in the residence halls, you are agreeing to do uh, this to follow these procedures that are designed to protect the, the health of everybody. And uh, I, I, it'll be an interesting um, process to see how that works. Uh, coming down heavily in terms of uh, penalties for non-compliance is just a, a rabbit hole you don't wanna go down. Uh, you, you know, who knows, we may have to do a little bit, but I, I, I really hope that we don't have to do that and then we can rely on the culture and the, the uh, everybody else sort of the sense of being part of the community. You know, if someone doesn't wear a, a face mask or face covering that is recommended or maybe even required in a uh, building or perhaps in, a, in an outdoor space where people can't socially distance, um, it, it's, it should be the others who ask, the other students, the other faculty, staff, who ask, could you put on a face covering? Now, the other challenge there that we're dealing with is that there are in individuals that for various reasons uh, cannot use a face covering or should not use them. So there are all sorts of subtleties and people are just gonna have to treat everyone with respect, not jump down their thro throats, make sure that um, we continue to communicate that we're in this for each other and be respectful of differences that there are, are times when um, you may think that someone's being non-compliant and you find out, oh, they actually are being compliant. So, that's going to be a massive culture uh, experience. Um, I think we all, all of our institutions have that, that are starting from a good base, but it's going to be, have to be taken to, it's going to have to be taken to another level in the fall. Well, what can students anticipate as it relates to dining facilities and residence halls in the fall? Well, at Radford, as we think about dining halls, it's gonna be a very different experience. Um, I will tell you that right now we have a model that is, is all you care to eat. Um, and, and we will still make sure that our students are, are well taken care of, but knowing the traditional buffets that they're accustomed to, they, they won't, won't have that type of system. Um, you will, there will likely be individuals serving with masks and gloves on. Um, there will likely be a change in hours to reduce the density within the, the dining locations. Um, there'll probably be more, more food that's actually packaged. As we think about the, the residence halls, I'll just give you, you one example of how things will, will be very, very different for us. Traditionally, we would have move in over a, a two or a three day period. And when we're fortunate enough to move in on the same weekend, we take up all the hotels and the interstate backs up. Um, but one of the things that, that will be different for us, that we're going to be moving in over a 10-day period by appointment and reducing that, the, the number of families and students that are going to be on campus at the same time, because we, we just don't think that's wise in, in the work that we're going to be doing. Yeah, we're, I, I appreciate what, what President Hemphill said. All those are uh, really important considerations. The other thing I would add is that uh, we, when we started the process of thinking about our residence halls, we thought, well, maybe the smartest thing to do is to have single occupancy only. And then we realized when we talked to the community, members of the community, that that would put so much pressure, that would push so many students out into the community that we would have created a problem 
in Blacksburg and the surrounding communities. So uh, the balance of that um, took us back to housing about, about 9,000 of our students on campus in single and double occupancy. Not as many as we had last year, about maybe 1,400 fewer so that we can free up space for quarantine and isolation. Uh, but then that means that when we have doubles, we're gonna have those, the roommates are gonna be es essentially considered part of a pod or a family so that they are responsible for each other's um, health in a sense. And if one of them contracts the disease, they're, they're gonna have to uh, both be, <laughs> they're gonna have to trust each other and, re and be very open with each other. But uh, I think it can work. Um, the dining, same thing. Uh, we'll have a lot of grab and go opportunities. We we're planning to have uh, uh, to allow dining facilities to be occupied, but obviously at very, very much lower densities. So all of the public health considerations that you just heard about will be really important to making sure that we don't um, see outbreaks uh, in the as a result of the congregate settings that are just part of what it is to be on a college campus. Kevin, the, the only other thing I would say to that is that just to give you some idea of how students and families are thinking, you know, normally we would probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300 singles in the midst of our 3,400 or 3,500 or so beds. Um, this year we've had a request for about 600. And so you have more individuals requesting singles and we're working to look at how we can, can support as many of those as possible. President, President Hewer, Hewer, aren't you glad you don't have residence halls? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that the, love the, the environment it creates, but this year it'll be a little challenging. Yeah, I was gonna volunteer to be first response on that, on that question because it's not applicable. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, how will you all be communicating with your faculty, staff, and students in the coming months about your operations? I know there's been releases, but I'm sure there's other modes of communication you're going to be utilizing. What's that going to look like? Well, I think that's a, um, well, first of all, let me say we're going to use every means we have. Um, and the, the communication is so important and yet it's so, because things change so quickly, it's almost like sometimes I thought, well, what I said today was totally opposite tomorrow, especially in the spring as we were, were phasing down, so to speak. Um, but we, um, of course, we'll use our email systems, our, we have a, a web page uh, coronavirus updates. Uh, students themselves log in to the student information system. They receive a lot of the uh, of their information, particularly like financial aid and uh, those aspects through the uh, student information system. Our uh, awareness campaigns, our uh, media campaigns. Uh, believe it or not, uh, well, you know, and then the the social media, our news releases. Believe it or not, we're going to use some old-fashioned technology called the telephone um, to reach out to, to students and to people and uh, just every means we can think of. Again, the frustrating part is I, I wish, because so much of it can't be face-to-face -face right now, you know, I, I wish everybody could hear everything all at the same time um, because that's where um, questions arise. Uh, we've been doing town halls uh, frequently and we'll be doing even more of those like this, but to specialized or to specific audiences. Um, we have a website, bt.edu slash ready that has everything in it. So anything that anybody, any question anybody has is, is the answer will be posted there in some form or another. Um, but I, we are, it's interesting, we published a very detailed, well, relatively detailed um, plan for the fall on Monday, and of course, that immediately you, you're you're inundated with all sorts of uh, insights and, and new ideas that we need to incorporate. So we've been careful about uh, describing our plan as a living document and not something that is static. Um, so we're it's going to evolve. I, we're in conversations right now that are 
are uh, changing the way we're thinking about some of the policies that we have put in place. And so it'll be important that everybody stays in touch with our bt.edu slash ready uh, website, all of the, the people involved in Virginia Tech, students, parents, uh, faculty, staff, uh, alumni, uh, because that's where the latest information will be. But we're going to use every means we can to, to get it out there. Kevin, for us, we have been very intentional about, about publishing continually to communicate via our website with our COVID-19 um, webpage. But we've also had Zoom com a number of Zoom conversations, not only with the Faculty Senate, um, but also with our, our Student Government Association um, and a number of other conversations. I will tell you that as a part of this, as we rolled out our plan, I think about a, a week or so before, before Virginia Tech's plan, a part of one of the things that we did is that we sat down with focus groups with faculty, staff, and students because we wanted holes to be shot in it early um, as a part of it. And of course, same thing, Tim, there was a lot of great feedback that we received as a part of that particular process um, that we were able to make some adjustments on. But as a part of this now, the next wave for us is that we will have a number of town halls coming up, um, actually a couple next week. And then I think we have two more in July of town hall meetings, just continuing the conversation um, as we prepare for the fall, because as, as you heard from my colleagues, there's so many questions that, that, that come up as a part of just people thinking, and some of it we haven't considered, that we need to make sure that we put into um, on the table for a broader discussion. Great. It sounds like you all have dynamic plans <laughs> and um, also well-vetted plans as well for the fall. Um, if somebody in the community has a concern about aspects of operations at your institutions, who should they contact? For us, the person to contact is Dr. Mark Rao. Uh, he's our Vice President for External Relations. I'll be glad to, to give you his um, email address. That would probably be the easiest. We're all working remotely. Uh, M as in Mark, R O W H at N R dot E D U. And for Radford, it would be Ashley Shoemaker, who's our chief of staff and vice president for university relations and is quickly developing into our COVID 19 coordinator. Um, and I should have probably told her before I said this publicly. Actually, she already knows. Um, and as a part of that, um, reaching out to her on any of the issues that we're dealing with, the concerns may be there. I'll give you a phone number, which would be 540-831-5401. And for Virginia Tech, we're asking uh, community members, students, faculty, staff, uh, anybody who has questions about or, or concerns or ideas to send an email to ask VT, A-S-K-V-T at VT.edu. Obviously, if it's an emergency, the police department. And in, in, I can be reached at president at VT.edu. Uh, people aren't shy about sending me email, so I don't mind getting more. We have a bunch of people who can filter through it, and I get to see it as well. So, um, But AskVT at VT.edu is where we expect to be handling most of the traffic. Great. Well, as a part of our series, we always do a summary of these discussions. So we'll make sure that we've captured the contact information in the summary if anybody wants to follow back up on that. So thank you for sharing those contacts with us. Um, turn the page a little bit here on some positives. Can you all share some of the positives that you all have observed with the communities during this time? You know, it could be your campus community or the community at large. I guess I'll, I'll begin. Um, I, I would tell you that, that one of the things that I've appreciated about the New River Valley as well as the Commonwealth um, is the, the caring spirit that we have within the community. And it's one thing that I've noticed, whether it's the broader community or the, the Highlander family that we have, we seem to, to, to rally around each other in really amazing ways in the midst of, of a troubling time. And I think if you if you have a university or a community college, you're gonna run into to, to, to challenging times and complex issues. 
And so what I will tell you is we've gone through this particular experience, whether you're going out to the grocery store or to the pharmacy, um, the care and compassion, the question, how are you doing? Hang in there. We appreciate the work that's going on. You just hear so much of that support from the community. Now, you will also get the occasional question that may be, be challenging, but nine times out of 10, it's amazing support and care for what we have to do and what we're trying to do to support the community as well as our faculty, staff, and students. I would say, I would like to, to just zero in uh, for a minute on our campus community. Uh, and I have just been overwhelmed, very humbled by the very positive spirit and the work ethic of the people here at New River Community College. They're very much a, you know, what do we need to do? Let's get it done type of attitude. And out of that, it's just been the innovation, the creativity, the new ideas. And um, it's, it's, it's been overwhelming and it's, it's been very, um, um, very emotional at times when, when, when I, I look at it and, and exhausting when I look, look at what everybody's done and then the support of the community. Um, it's so, so yeah, there, there, there've been, I would say more positive than negative that has come out of this. And I just appreciate the, the, the warmth and the attitude and the let's take care of our students, let's take care of each other and let's get this work done. I agree with everything my two uh, president colleagues said. It's just the same experience I've had. I, I think the, the thing that impressed me the most initially was that when we announced that we were gonna extend spring break um, and then that we were gonna uh, move students out of the residence halls uh, there was a lot of concern over about 10,000 students who were remaining in town. And um, I think there was a little bit of skepticism that we would be able to pull this off. But everybody, including the community members, uh, uh, the residents of, of Blacksburg, just um, jumped at, at the latest public health guidelines and following them, uh, physical distancing, the uh, voluntary self-isolation, wearing a face coverings, go down a list. And the fact that people were so fast and so compliant uh, really saved us from a major outbreak, I do believe. The other thing that just is so impressed me is the, how our faculty and our researchers and our, our students uh, pivoted their entire operations toward COVID-19 in a split second. I mentioned the two testing labs that were set up uh, and they were, they were basically taking research equipment and dedicating it to analysis for COVID-19, for the, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they uh, and we had a researcher step in to make uh, PPE, to uh, modify ventilators and BiPAP machines to make them useful for our, our hospitals. Uh, we had a, a public health expert switch over and really focus on communications. And uh, a couple of them became uh, global stars in the sense of sharing their expertise. Lindsay Marr and her work on um, aerosols and the uh, virus particles transmitted through the air was just, uh, it, it was cited everywhere. Um, and that was, I was really a moment of uh, pride to see all of our faculty and students who had that expertise sharing it willingly and, um, and doing it not to be popular or not, not to expose themselves to uh, for their own purposes, but really because they cared about our society, our community, and our, our campus. And that was just an amazing feeling. Hey, Kevin, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't, I didn't share this. You know, our, our faculty, they, are, they pride themselves in teaching excellence, but to pivot that quickly over a week's period of, a week period of time and to pivot to online, um, and everyone, of course, we, all of our courses are not taught online, I have to say to this day, I've still not received one complaint from a faculty member about what we've had to do in terms of going to the online uh, modality and, and moving forward. Our provost has not received an email of complaint as it relates to moving online. Now, of course, we're, we, we are now talking about the fall, but as we, as we went through that period, 
the compassion that they showed for our students and the experience was pretty powerful. And when I, was, when I zoomed into a number of classes and to hear our students talk about how wonderful their faculty have been in the transition, I, it was heartwarming, definitely. And if I may add another point too, um, our data, you know, we're looking at our spring data and we're seeing some very positive um, outcomes, not what you might have expected. Our, actually, some initial uh, data show that our course withdrawals were actually the lowest that they've been in about six years. Uh, and our success rates for students. So, you know, it's, like I said, good things have come uh, out of some, some very difficult circumstances in which, um, as President Hemphill said, I mean, they turned these courses around in a flash. And then as we start looking at the results of turning it around, and it's still as positive, and in some cases more positive, maybe. So it's, it's been good. We saw the same, uh, we had the same experience, just uh, 4,500 course sections flipped in, in a period of a week or so. Um, and students persisting. Um, the challenge is, is the fall and making sure that we maintain the quality that we're really all expecting. Our faculty um, pride themselves on the quality of their, their instruction and, and we've got the summer to figure it out, but it is not an insignificant. It's different than going remote. It's, it's about providing some, some quality experiences to go along with that. But we had some of our faculty as, as President Hemphill and President Hoover said that that actually turned this into a, a a positive and really enhanced the way that they're 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 teaching and learning that was effective. Uh, I just I was just so impressed with that. A lot of creativity and a lot of passion, a lot of um, uh, support for the institution and our students. Thank you all for sharing the positives that you've observed. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I want to get to another topic that I think is front of mind for a lot of people as well, not just the return to campus, but how are decisions going to be made around fall athletics and other in-person events that your campuses often host? I've asked everyone to call Brian if they have questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him start off. I was going to punt to Pat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that's an easy because we know we have club sports and they're on hold and <laughs> All right. no large activities on campus until further notice and no use by outside groups yes. on our campus until further notice. So, so that's an easy one for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kevin, I would say that uh, the NCAA, I think they did a, a, a really great job in terms of providing guidelines for the conferences to consider and to, to as we're looking at developing plans, um, I would tell you that, that the conferences are really taking a, a really significant leadership role and working with the institutions as institutions are developing their individual plans and protocols that are really looking back to that broader document that we received from the NCAA. Um, I would tell you that, the, from, that from my perspective, um, the health and safety of our student athletes are, is first and foremost. Um, do I think that we will have some form of, of athletics in the fall? I think we will. Will the timing be the same? We don't. We don't know the answer to that. That would be that would be um, premature to to make that statement. Will we have spectators? We don't know the answer to that at this point. There's still some unknowns that we have to work through. But I know that we are working through our processes now of returning our student athletes um, as we get into late June and in July, and they will begin to, to start their, their preparation. Um, but, but the conferences are really taking a strong lead. And that's my guess of things that are probably going on with the ACC as well, providing great leadership. Yeah, I think um, exactly. I think um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, the early onboarding of some of our student athletes over the summer has gone well. And I just talked to our athletic director today about um, how that was going. He was very impressed with the protocols that have been put in place and the, and the way that's been happening. Uh, we need to be for football, and that's where the most of the concern is because that's a sport that gets started early. Uh, we have to be in practice mode by mid-July in order to 
give the student athlete six weeks or so of preparation before we start the season. So if uh, we're in a position where we think it's safe for our student athletes in mid-July, there's a good chance that the season will start on time. Uh, but as President Hippel said, we don't yet have a clear idea about how we're gonna populate the uh, Lane Stadium or eventually Castle Coliseum. And that um, it, we're working hard on it, but that's gonna be the big challenge in front of us. We wanna make sure that we are able to um, do it safely. And, um, and if we can't, we're not gonna do it. And then I think, uh, I, I just personally don't think a TV version of, of, uh, of student athletes playing in an empty stadium makes a lot of sense. So we're, it all goes together and, and uh, it'll evolve and we'll, we'll keep everyone informed as, as we make decisions and as the situation becomes clearer, but I'm optimistic. Thanks for sharing what you can at this point in time. Well, we are rapidly approaching the end of our one hour program. And uh, the community has done an excellent job submitting thoughtful questions, which spurred some great conversation among our panelists this evening. I'd like to thank each of our panelists for your participation. I'd also like to express my appreciation for the leadership the presidents deliver across the region on a daily basis. The institutions you serve represent a significant amount of economic activity for our region. Based on our conversation this evening, it has not been an easy task for you to maneuver the operations back in March, through the summer, and now heading into the fall. So thank you very much. As we look to the future, the Public Health Task Force is creating the playbook to help everyone in the New River Valley navigate the next phase, recovery. This series of virtual town halls has been your opportunity to engage in that conversation. The Public Health Task Force is contemplating future town hall events in the coming months to be sure relevant and timely information is widely available. So please stay tuned for any future announcements. If you're not available to watch live, the series will be archived on YouTube. Links will also be posted to agency websites and social media. The series will also be rebroadcast on local access cable stations, including Comcast and Chintel Channel 190 for Christiansburg and Montgomery County, along with Comcast Channel 2 in Blacksburg. A summary of tonight's town hall will be available at montva.com forward slash NRV town hall. In the summary, you can find the web links each institution is updating regularly for more information about their operations in the fall. And before we wrap up this evening, I'd like to extend a special thank you to those behind the scenes who have made the virtual town hall series possible. And they are the public information officers who serve local governments, agencies, and higher education institutions in the region. This program certainly would not be possible without their contributions. And lastly, I'd like to express my gratitude for the NRV Public Health Task Force. Thank you for your leadership during a challenging time and demonstrating an unwavering commitment to serve the entire region. The spirit of collaboration with which this group approaches their work has made a tremendous impact on the overall well being of the region and serves as an inspiration. I consider myself extremely fortunate to call the New River Valley home, and the regional response to the COVID 19 pandemic makes me a proud resident. So thank you and be well. <laughs>